Day two. War and conflict have their own dynamics, and once you let out some slack on the leash of the dogs of war, there is a great risk that they might just slip out of your hands altogether. On October 17th, 1962, American President John F. Kennedy loosens the slack on his dogs of war, just like Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev had already done five months ago. This is Time Ghost, the Cuban Missile Crisis. I'm Indy Nidell. When the American administration found out that the Soviet Union had placed nuclear missiles on Cuba, they struggled to come up with an immediate response. XCOM, the group dealing with the crisis, wavered between a stern warning to the Soviets and the complete destruction of Cuba. President Kennedy is undecided and still wants all options to be left on the table. On the morning of the 17th, he receives a briefing outlining the possible courses of action. His close advisor and speechwriter, Ted Sorensen, has compiled the views from the day before. He outlines four options. Track A, political warning, and if the missiles are not then removed, limited airstrikes. Track B, limited airstrikes, and then a demand to remove the missiles. Track C, political actions followed by total naval blockade and a declaration of war on Cuba. Track D, full-scale invasion to take Cuba away from Castro with no warning whatsoever. Sorensen points out, it is generally agreed that these missiles, even when fully operational, do not significantly alter the balance of power, i.e. they do not significantly increase the potential megatonnage capable of being unleashed on American soil, even after a surprise American nuclear strike. So they all agree that the missiles are not a real problem, and yet the preparations for war go ahead. In fact, a possible invasion of Cuba has long been in the planning stages. A couple days ago, the day before the crisis began, an exercise was begun to land on the Puerto Rican island of Vieques, which represented a fantasy island nation ruled by the dictator Ortsak. Take out Ortsak and occupy the island. Now, Ortsak is Castro spelled backwards. So there was little doubt, even to the slowest minds involved, what the real objective was. The exercise involved 40 ships, 20,000 Marines, massive air support, and Puerto Rico. Diverting them to actually invade Cuba would be easily possible. With additional preparations and forces, an invasion can be underway in as little as 10 days from today. Those additional preparations begin. Along the eastern seaboard, troops at all bases are discreetly increased and made combat ready. Spy plane activities are also increased and the plans for the Ortsak exercise revised to fit the new situation. At 8.30 a.m., the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the members of XCOM meet at the Pentagon to continue the decision regarding a definite plan. Defense Secretary McNamara has even spent the night at the Pentagon to supervise planning. From the record, it's obvious that it's not a response to the possible objectives of the Soviets that's driving their decisions, but what the different factions already believed before the crisis. Those that believed in thawing relations with the Soviets are advocating diplomacy. Those who believe that Cuba must be neutralized tend towards invasion. The idea of a naval blockade, for which there is neither a plan nor a risk assessment, starts gaining some traction though, with among others, General Taylor, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. After the meeting, one of the strongest proponents of an invasion, CIA Director McCone, goes to brief President Kennedy at the White House. His notes show that he walks away from that meeting with the impression that Kennedy too wants to invade. But Kennedy's notes contradict this. He's still very much undecided. McCone then takes a car to Pennsylvania to meet with former President General Dwight Eisenhower, at JFK's request, to get his presidential and military advice. McCone comes away with the opinion that Eisenhower too supports decisive military action. And yet, no one knows what the Soviets are really after, which Sorensen points out. The Soviet purpose in making this move is not understood, whether it is for purposes of diversion, harassment, provocation, or bargaining. One of the assumptions is that their true objective might be Berlin. The situation in that divided city is the first topic on the president's regular agenda when he receives the German foreign minister, Dr. Gerhard Schroeder, at 11 a.m. at the White House. Kennedy asks if the Germans have any reason to believe the Soviets will make another move for Berlin. Take. 
neigen eher zu der Meinung, dass die Sowjets bei allen Versuchen, vor allen Dingen psychologischen Druck äh, auszuüben, im Grunde darauf aus sind, weiter äh, zu sprechen und äh, weiter zu versuchen, ihre Ziele ohne Gewalt zu äh, erreichen. Schroeder says, they don't have any indication of an escalation there, nor does their analysis of the situation show that it would make sense for the Soviets to do so at this point. One thing Schroeder says in passing, though, is remarkably important to the situation. Ich bin der Überzeugung, dass Khrushchev seinerseits überzeugt ist, dass es gewisse Dinge gibt, für die die Amerikaner und für die der, der Westen wirklich kämpfen würde. Er muss nur die Partie so spielen, dass man äh, sozusagen weiter und weiter eingeengt äh, ist, ohne reagiert zu haben. Und dann hat er natürlich in dieser psychologischen Auseinandersetzung äh, einen großen Of course, Schroeder does not know the significance of his words at this point, as he does not know about the growing crisis over Cuba. As the day proceeds, the crisis deepens, as more intelligence on the missile buildup comes to light. The ultra-high altitude flights over Cuba continue. The Lockheed U-2, known as the Dragon Lady, has already played a central part in the crisis and will continue to do so for its duration. This aircraft is a remarkable feat of engineering, but it's also a little crazy. In 1962, it's been in operation for just over seven years. Improved versions are still in use by the U.S. Air Force in 2020, as it is the fastest way to get aerial reconnaissance other than satellites. In 1962, there are very few satellites, and it's the only way to gather photographic intelligence over enemy territory at a reasonably safe distance from anti-aircraft measures. Now, reasonably safe is not the same thing as safe. See, it had been assumed by both the US and Great Britain that Soviet radar could only pick up signals as high as 19,800 meters, like 65,000 feet, because that was as high as British and American radar worked. It was also assumed that Soviet surface-to-air missiles, SAMs, could not reach higher than that. Both assumptions were wrong. And back on May the 1st, 1960, the Soviets used SAMs to shoot down a U-2 over Russia. The pilot, Captain Francis Gary Powers, parachutes out and survives the crash. While the pilot of a pursuing Soviet MiG-19 isn't as lucky when he is hit and killed by friendly fire. Powers is then captured by the Soviets and the whole thing becomes a complicated diplomatic incident, which only ends this year in February when Powers and another American spy are exchanged for two Soviet operatives held by the US. But the U-2 is not only dangerous to fly because it can be shot down. In essence, the plane is a combination of a subsonic jet and a glider. At ultra high altitudes, it has to be flown within a narrow speed corridor to avoid stalling. The pilot can only vary speed by five miles per hour upwards or downwards to keep the plane flying and not have it fall apart around him. At normal altitudes, the controls are extremely resistant, requiring the pilot to use muscular strength to maneuver. With its short fuselage and enormously long wings, it has an operational altitude of 70,000 feet, 21,336 meters. But to be light enough to reach that altitude, many compromises in safety design had to be made. The cabin is only partially pressurized, and the pilots have to wear spacesuits and breathe oxygen. There have been several incidents of decompression sickness and at least nine cases of pilots suffering permanent brain damage from flying a U-2, and at least one pilot has passed out, crashed, and died because of a malfunction in his oxygen supply. Landing the plane is also extremely tricky, as the long wing-to-fuselage ratio creates ground effects that can cause sudden upsurges and a crash. When you put the plane down, the wingtips are actually pulled against the ground, which is why they're coated with titanium to withstand the friction. Landing is, in fact, so complicated that it requires a chase car to guide the pilot 
and a second pilot on the ground assisting the flying pilot by relaying how the plane is behaving from an outside view. Because of incidents and accidents, and the obvious fact that it's illegal to fly planes into other countries' airspace without permission, the U-2 program is highly controversial. In 1962, it isn't even operated by the military. The U-2s belong to the CIA, and they have been financed without congressional budget approval through secret slush funds, which the CIA is the only federal agency that is allowed to have. At this point, though, they prove invaluable in assessing the situation on Cuba. October 16th and 17th are both clear days over the island. The U-2 flights come back with a load of new images. The analysts discover a range of surface-to-air missile batteries that could threaten the U-2s and which definitely lower the probability of successful airstrikes. They discover more mid-range missile sites, but the pictures are not high resolution enough to see if the SS-4 missiles are launch ready, nor where their warheads might be stored. Most alarming is the discovery of intermediate range missile launch ramps. Although they don't find any missiles for these, this now extends the threat beyond the East Coast and the Midwest. These missiles can reach any major city in the continental US, except Seattle in the distant Pacific Northwest. While Kennedy flies out to do political rallies in Connecticut, members of XCOM meet once again. The new information does not help the decision making, but it does harden the drive for a decisive military response. Among all of the saber rattling, one voice urges restraint. It's Adlai Stevenson, the US ambassador to the United Nations. The former Democratic presidential candidate is famous for his intellect, reason, eloquence, and diplomacy. Hardliners consider him too soft and indecisive. During the Bay of Pigs invasion, he had largely been kept out of the loop to avoid his uncomfortable advice. And with incomplete information, he then suffered public humiliation when he firmly denied any operative involvement by the US in an open session at the UN, only to be refuted by his own administration. This time around, he's in the loop and receives the XCOM briefings. He now urges the president to talk to Khrushchev and Castro to avoid a conflict that will inevitably lead to retaliation in other regions. He writes, to start or risk starting a nuclear war is bound to be divisive at best, and the judgments of history seldom coincide with the tempers of the moment. He ends his letter with, I confess I have many misgivings about the proposed course of action, but to discuss them further would add little to what you already have in mind. So I will only repeat that it should be clear as a pike staff that the US was, is, and will be ready to negotiate the elimination of bases and anything else. Blackmail and intimidation never, negotiation and sanity always. These wise words will not be heeded for many days to come. And on October 17th, as night settles over America and a new day dawns over the Soviet Union, the preparations for war on both sides continue and begin taking on a life of their own. I will see you tomorrow on day three when President Kennedy confronts the Soviets for the first time and gets the response he fears the most. And even as you watch this, we are making plans for our next big project, which will cover Pearl Harbor minute by minute this December on our World War II in real time channel. You can see the teaser for that right here. We are a long way from being able to finance that project, so please support us at timegoes.tv or patreon.com. Good night and good luck.